For the past 40 years, the People's Republic of China has been synonymous with one thing, progress. Since the paramount leader of the Chinese Communist Party, Deng Xiaoping, opened China to foreign investment, China has seen meteoric growth rates with GDP growth percentages sometimes reaching the mid-teens. The open door policy, or Gaige Kaifeng, has been one of the most consequential economic miracles of the modern world, lifting well over a billion people out of poverty and enriching the global population to standards that were never thought imaginable. However, the open door policy was just that, an open door to foreign capital in liberal economics. Deng's philosophy was not to change the People's Republic by liberalizing China's political system like Poland or Czechoslovakia, but to build the economy while the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, remained in power. In essence, China had an efficient authoritarian government and an efficient liberal market. For the past two decades, many political analysts and commentators have witnessed the rise of China and called this political chimera the perfection of the totalitarian state. Any talk of the future of geopolitics was prefaced with what would become of China and when would it replace the United States as the world's global power. China has definitely seen remarkable growth rates throughout the decades and has shocked the world with its poverty-relieving miracle. However, China's politics is not the efficient, unified system that it is often portrayed as in the West. In this entry, I will explain the economic divisions of China that are often overlooked. This is the 10,000. If you enjoy the content, like and subscribe to support the channel. To know where we are going, we must understand where we have come from. And the arc of Chinese history is no different. For much of its history, China has been a country that teetered between openness and isolationism. The openness led to wealth, but also to division. And the isolationism led to unification, but also poverty. During the Qing Dynasty's rule in the mid-19th century, China was going through one of its isolationist periods. The Europeans, however, were not going through one of their isolationist periods and wanted access to Chinese markets, which they achieved with their sale of opium and their aptly named gunboat diplomacy. A new era of openness was thrust upon China and trade, even if it was forced, made China very rich. Over time, however, there became a great wealth disparity from this trade with the Europeans. The coastal regions that continually engaged with the Europeans ended up benefiting much more from this economic structure than the harder to reach regions of the interior. Consequentially, numerous rebellions started in the interior provinces that aimed to undo this trend of openness and inequality. Among these revolutions were the unsuccessful Taiping Rebellion, Boxer Rebellion, Nian Rebellion, and Hui People, or Muslim Rebellions, which tore China apart and led to the eventual destruction of the Qing Dynasty. The last of these rebellions, Mao Zedong's revolution, raised an army of peasants from the interior and eventually conquered the whole country. In 1949, Mao proclaimed the People's Republic of China from the Peace Gate of Heaven, or Tiananmen, and then proceeded to close off China's markets and return China to its pre-European isolation. In a truly Marxist way, China had a strong and unified, but isolationist government that was justified by communist thought. This strong isolationist government lasted until Mao's death and the ascension of Deng as China's head of state. Deng introduced a new mandate for the party's legitimacy, economic growth. It was Deng and his economic reforms that pushed China on the path of growth that it benefits from today. We do not have time to go over the entire economic impact of Deng and his predecessor's reforms, but it is important that we go over the stages. This economic reform and growth had four main stages. In the first stage, in 1978 to 1984, Deng decollectivized the agricultural industry and allowed provisions for market prices as well as the privatization of urban industry. Deng then created a series of special economic zones for foreign investment that was fairly free of bureaucratic regulations that hampered economic growth. In the second stage from 1984 to 1993, decentralization was the main theme. Industries that were micromanaged from the capital in Beijing were now divided and managed by the provincial leaders. This led to a lot of privatization on the local level. As provincial leaders experimented with ways that would improve GDP growth, the private sector soon became a much larger percentage of the Chinese economy. In the second stage, China was again becoming richer, but more decentralized. 
The third stage occurred from 1993 to 2005. During this period, Deng's reforms were exacerbated under new head of state, Zhang Zemin. Most state-run enterprises were liquidated and their assets sold to investors. Trade barriers were reduced and banking regulations were reformed. This era was the height of China's deregulatory efforts and the beginning of its prestige. In 1997, Britain transferred the city of Hong Kong to Beijing, which accelerated mainland China's growth astronomically. And in 2001, China finally joined the World Trade Organization. However, this was the time that the Chinese elite began to rediscover China's divide. Deng's policy of unleashing the market allowed for unregulated growth. State-run enterprises that were now privatized now had to operate efficiently or had to dissolve, making full employment a thing of the past and unemployment a new reality. The fourth and final stage of economic reform was from 2005 until the rise of Xi Jinping in the beginning of 2013. In this era, under conservative paramount leader Hu Jintao, economic reform and privatization began to slow. The Chinese public sector received much of the investment. Some of the investment helped to modernize China's economy, and it went to areas such as healthcare, but large amounts of it went to Chinese strategic industries. Chinese national champions, such as Huawei and Tencent, were heavily subsidized, creating what economists called a crowding out effect, and preventing investment and competition from the private sector. This was the era China's economy began to slow. Growth rates rarely went north of 10%, as it reached its height of 14% GDP increase in 2007 and shot down to around 9% for the years after. Since the 18th Party Congress in 2012, the GDP growth rates hovered at around 7-6%. to As economic realities began to rear their heads, China's elite realized the limits of Deng's mandate. Thus, China was heading for a new era, one of transition and one of questions. These questions started to be answered by the ascension of Xi Jinping as paramount leader. The era of Deng is about to be over, but its political legacy still exists. Like the late Qing dynasty before it, Deng Xiaoping's China created two main political factions within Chinese politics, the globalists and the populists. The globalists are the faction who wanted to foster greater connection to the outside world. Economically, the globalists are from the elite, and geographically, they usually originate from the urban and coastal regions of China. They are the businessmen, the entrepreneurs, the diplomats, and the advocates for trade. Much like their predecessors in the late Qing era, their economy was more intertwined with London and New York than it is with the Chinese interior heartland. Consequently, they normally care about the movements in the market than the political whims of Beijing. Most importantly, they view rule by party consensus as crucial. The late Deng and his cadre of globalists are afraid of a single strongman like Mao returning to China's political scene and inflicting the horrors akin to Mao's great leap forward in cultural revolution. The shift from rule to man to rule to party has been credited with bringing political stability and economic growth to China. Contrary to them are the populace, largely Mao Zedong's initial base. Their politicians are usually the party leaders in less developed interior states. They represent the farmers, the migrant workers, and the urban poor. Like Mao and the 19th century boxers, they advocate for populist issues, egalitarian issues, and concerns that would benefit the interior and thus create cohesiveness in China. These two factions struggled for control throughout Deng's era. Deng himself was obviously a globalist, and after he partially retired in 1989, he installed a political puppet, Zhang Zemin, the party secretary from Shanghai. With little real power actually given to him for the first half of his reign, he had little choice but to bend to Deng's will and become a globalist. After the party congress in 2002, Zhang also partially retarded and Hu Jintao, a populist, became paramount leader. Like many populists, he is a man from humble beginnings and was born in a landlocked province, Anhui, who, although a populist, often ruled through party consensus and did not govern with a strong cult of personality. Unlike his predecessors, Hu Jintao actually walked away from power when his second term was up in 2012. This leaves us to our current paramount leader, President of China, Xi Jinping. Xi is a truly interesting leader. 
He was born into a well-respected upper-class family, but politically, he is very much a populist. In that respect, he is very much like Donald Trump. Like Donald Trump, he wanted to make China great again with his Zhongguomeng, or Chinese dream. Xi is acutely aware of the economic divisions that plague China and their severity, and he has tried to act accordingly. Xi is much more of a populist than Hu Jintao, centralizing party power and exerting unprecedented control over private industry. Unconvinced by his predecessor's fear of strongmanship, Xi Jinping has cultivated the largest cult of personality and power centralization since Mao. She has ended the Deng era reforms by increasing the power of the state, nationalizing industry, heavily investing in quasi and outright state-owned enterprises, and clamping down on political freedom. It does not seem like Deng's openness is set to return. Under Xi's centralization of power, China is now becoming unified. But as a supposed international power, the question is, will isolation follow? China is experiencing the largest migration in history, the migration of its rural poor to its urban metropolises. As economic growth continues to slow, as it has for the past decade, migrants from the farms to the cities will have to remain in the impoverished countryside. The small release valve for economic anxiety is beginning to dwindle. In order to prevent the explosion or implosion of Chinese society, President Xi Jinping needs to throttle both the coast's economic ambitions and the interior's economic anxiety. To accomplish this, when he took office, Xi began his now famous anti-corruption campaigns. The campaigns mainly attacked the capitalist class, imprisoning high-profile party leaders and plundering their wealth to finance Xi's anti-poverty crusades that appeases the interior regions. Unfortunately for Xi, this caused mass capital flight from China that only heightened with the U.S. trade conflict. Although the loss of wealth is a problem for the regime to survive, the riches of China must be submissive to the party. As Christ said, no man can have two masters. You will have to love one and hate the other. The party correctly believes the same. Besides the capitalist, the other institution that must serve either the party or money is the PLA, or People's Liberation Army, the armed forces of the People's Republic of China. Since the People's Republic of China is a one-party state, the PLA is essential to the party's survival. Normally, any state like the People's Republic, the goals of the army and the party are aligned. However, with the growing involvement of the PLA and Chinese industry, allegiance does not seem to follow traditional guidelines. Since the relaxing of regulations in the 2000s, the PLA has owned corporations and the officers themselves are tied into specific non-governmental related business interests, thus making them inclined to globalist thinking and ideals. However, globalist ideals are just the beginning of the problems with the army. Xi himself, although a populist, has not shied away from internationalism as trade is still largely the lifeblood of the regime and the supposed path to China's preeminence. Thus, Xi has not wholly shied away from the divisions that haunt China. If geographic and economic divisions become unmanageable, Xi would have to worry about an even more populist strongman replacing him. Because of this question of loyalty, Xi Jinping assumed the role of joint head of command in early 2016, giving him two very busy jobs, running the civilian government and coordinating, and more importantly, monitoring troop movement. The founder of Stratford, George Friedman, states that she most likely would not have usurped the army if it wasn't absolutely necessary, dividing time and resources to micromanage both the civilian sphere and the military one is cumbersome. Consolidating this much power in one man is a very precarious and fragile position. The ascendance of a strong man does not speak wonders for the health of a system, nor should anyone see this consolidation of power under Xi as a sign of strength for the Chinese Communist Party. It is a weakness that Xi's political opponents might exploit. As I am writing now, there are disease-related riots in Hubei province, the epicenter of the recent outbreak, and an interior province. The Hubei protesters are shouting Jiao, a common and now anti-CCP phrase that have been used in anti-government riots since the Hong Kong Umbrella Revolution in 2014. Before these riots, the government expelled all journalists and it is now illegal for any foreigner to enter the central kingdom. These protests might not amount to much, 
or they might be a sign of a changing tide and a new era of Chinese politics. In my next entry, I will explain why the CCP cannot continue to exist as this political chimera.